ready for a new year, 2013. I hope you are. I hope you had a Merry Christmas. And I hope that you're ready for 2013 because it's just around the corner. We're going to talk about getting ready for a new year. I know that God is interested in every aspect of our lives. God is interested in our spiritual life, in our physical well-being. He's interested in our emotional state. He's interested in our financial state. I know that he is interested in our relationships. God wants to work in our lives. I'm thinking this year that I might go on a diet. The other day I was trying to zip up my leather coat and I must have worked on it for four or five minutes and I said to my wife they don't make zippers like they used to make zippers because when I was a kid I could take a zipper in just a second have it zipped up and she said when you were a kid maybe you could see the zipper <laughs> and so I'm not quite sure what she was telling me but I think I'm going to take it to heart. See if I can't see the zipper a little better this coming year. I don't know about you what your 2012 was like. You get to thinking about a year, it's a long time. I woke up about 3 o'clock this morning. I got thinking about how many Januaries have I experienced in my life. I've only experienced 74 Januaries. I don't know how many more Januaries I may have. But when you think about a January... 365 days, that is a long, long time. And so we're going to kind of look at the future. I know oftentimes we want to look at the past. When you think about the past, we all had situations in our life last year. Sometimes they were real blessings. Sometimes they were real disappointments. There were people that got married last year. And there were people probably got divorced last year. There were those that had new babies. How many we've seen dedicated this year. But there were also people that lost loved ones to death. You never know what a year holds for you. But I don't know one thing. I get excited about a new year. I'm always glad when the old year is over with. Forget about it. Shirley and I had our own issues last year. Not with each other, but I mean health issues. <laughs> and I want to clarify those things. Uh, we had our own issues with health. Uh, we have to face new things for next year. We're not quite sure how we're going to handle those. But we want God to lead us and guide us and direct us. And so we're going to look at some scripture today that's going to help us to understand how we can be ready for 2013. I think every one of us here really would love to have a prosperous new year and to go 365 days of blessings. Now, it probably won't happen that they'll just be blessings. There will be some heartaches, and there will be some disappointment. But I think if we're prepared for it and realize that God is in charge of every minute aspect of our lives that he's concerned about, I think it will help us to make our way through next year. As you know, December the 31st, midnight, everybody looks at Times Square. They're on that one Times Square building at midnight, there's a ball, it's called a time ball, on top of that building, and it begins to drop. And it slowly makes its way down. Now, I have to admit, I don't see it that day. I usually see a re rerun the next day. But it's a time, ball, a, a time ball that comes down. And a new year begins. There's a new year, 2013. It's just staring you right in the face, and it's saying to you, come on. Come check me out. See what I have for you. And so we should have some excitement about the new year. And I am praying that you're ready for the new year. And we'll look at some things today that I hope will help us to enter into the new year 2013. January is an opening door to a new beginning. The word January comes from the Roman god Janus, J-A-N-U-S. That's where we get January from him. He is known as the god of doorways and passageways. 
And so we call it January because there's a doorway that's opening up to us into a new beginning. As a matter of fact, if you've ever seen a medallion of Giannis, there's two faces on it. One face is pointing to the back behind him, and the other one is pointed forward. He is that guy. It's a transition from looking to the past into the future. So that's why we call it January. It is a brand new door that we are going to walk through. It is a transition. I love those transitional times in my life. I've had a lot of them. They're challenging. They're exciting. They add a lot of pizzazz to your life, those transitions that we have to go through. Now, the question that I would ask each one of us here today, am I ready to move in to 2013 and to live that life that God has for me for next year? Am I ready for that transition? And if not, what can I do to get ready to transition into next year? See, I think life is very important. I think sometimes we look at life in a very nonchalant way. But I really believe life is so important. We need to be ready for the challenges that are before us. And so the question is, am I ready? And we're going to look a little bit today as to how do we get ready for next year. I'm going to put a scripture up on the screen from Joshua. Joshua chapter 3, verse number 3, 4, and 5. And I'd like to read those scriptures and follow along with me because there's so much in this particular scripture that helps us to move in and transition to a new beginning. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Two words I want you to focus upon. When you see God, the latter part of that scripture says, go after him. Verse number four. Yet there shall be a space between you and it. At about 2,000 cubits per measure, come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Two words in that scripture. The word pass and the word space. You need to keep a space between you and God because you have not passed this way yet. 2013, you have not lived that at this moment. Only God knows what is there for us. So it's important for us to see God, to go after him, to have a space between us, and to realize we've not passed this way before. Verse number 5, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The word sanctify and the word wonder. Now, here's the picture that we see. Israel has been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, living a defeated life. Israel knew every grain of sand upon the desert floor. They probably could tell you what colors they were. But they had not yet been in the promised land. And they're making ready to enter into the promised land. They're going to cross over the Jordan River. Now let me tell you something about the Jordan River that I believe. Oftentimes people think that that is a picture of when you die and you go to heaven crossing over the Jordan River. There have been songs written with that idea. Well, I don't believe that's what it's talking about because when you go to heaven, there will be no battles over there. But when you cross over Jordan, when the Israelites crossed over Jordan into the Promised Land, they had battle after battle after battle. So crossing over Jordan is not a picture of going to heaven. It is a picture of a believer, of a Christian that is living a Christian life but is not living a, an abundant life. They have not yet come to that place where this Christian life is so important to them. And they find joy and peace within that life. And so there is that time when you must cross over the Jordan River. And when you do so, I guarantee you there will be some battles there for you to face. If you 
really want to become a Christian, if you really want to be one that stands out, one that is authentic. See, Jesus said, I've come to give you life, but I've come to give you life more abundantly. And so I remember for so many years I had life, but I did not have that abundant life. And crossing over the Jordan River sometimes is a real battle in your life. And that's why we need God to help us. So first of all, ways to be ready for the new year. What are some ways that we can prepare ourselves for that new year just in a couple of days? Number one, watch for God. Watch for God. And they commanded the people, saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God, represents the presence of God and the power of God. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was in that traveling tabernacle. You remember that piece of, of furniture that was inside the Ark of, uh, uh, inside the tabernacle? There within the Holy of Holies, it was the Ark of the Covenant. It was three and a half feet long, two and a half feet wide, and two and a half feet tall. It was in the Holy of Holies. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was a mercy seat. It was a piece of gold laid across the top. Had cherub angels on each end with their wings outward like this toward each other. Touched each other, so under the wings was a mercy seat. And it was there once a year the high priest could go in and offer the blood from the animals for the people and placed it upon the mercy seat once a year. And it was there that the Shekinah glory came and God accepted that as a sacrifice for their sin. And so it represents the very presence of God. And so he says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, when you see it, watch for God. Because the Ark of the Covenant represents, I believe, the Lord Jesus Christ and the mercy seat because he is our mercy seat. And so we need to watch for God. Watch for the presence of God in everything in your life. I don't care what minute issue that you have next year. God is interested in that issue. I don't care what it is. If you're a believer... God is present with you constantly. Watch for him as you enter into next year. Let him be a part of your life. Let him help you make the decisions that you need to make. He's interested. He wants to make the journey with you as the doors begin to open. You see, for Israel, it was their ball that was falling. It was their January. It was a new beginning for them, just like it is for us. But not only does it represent the presence of God, but also the power of God. Do you realize how powerful God truly is? I know, I know we say we do. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think there's anyone sitting here that could ever comprehend how powerful God is. I mean, if we were here when God created the universe and spoke it into existence, then we would say, wow. God is powerful. But we read about it. We see portions of it. But we really do not know how powerful God is. Oftentimes wonder, why do I go through life in such a weak condition? When I have the very presence of God dwelling within me through the Holy Spirit of God, the power of God is there for every aspect of my life. Why is it? that I don't tap into that power that is there. Is it because I really don't believe it? Is it because I say, well, sure, I believe God. Yes, I believe there's a Christ. I believe him. But do I really believe he is real and is in existence? Or is it just a concept? I'm just putting something out there for us to think about. If I believe that he's real, and he's present within my life, and he has great power, then why would I live such a life that is dysfunctional? One that is just a mess. Why would I live that way if I really believe that God is interested in my life and every aspect of my life? But he says not only watch for God, 
in the scripture, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the priest and the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after God. Think about that. Go after God. Where God is, that's where I want to be. You know, with the Israelites, when God, that cloud would lead them, they would pick up that tabernacle and they'd start on a march and the cloud would lead them in the daytime and, and the fire by night. And when God stopped, they stopped. And when God would go, they would go. And when God would stop, they would stop. And when God would go, they would go. Follow after God. Find where he is. Yes, that means that we truly do need the directions that God has for us. The very same picture that we see for the Israelites in the book of Joshua are real for me. Starting January the 1st, 2013. We need that direction. Don't leave God out of your life. Secondly, watch for God. Secondly, follow God. Follow Him. Let's read verse 4. Yet there shall be a space between you and it. There shall be a space between you and the Ark of the Covenant. There shall be a space between you and God. About 2,000 cubits by measure. That's about a half a mile. Come not near unto it that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. A space. I got to thinking about that space last night. I love to just let my mind go wild, thinking about my relationship with God. What is this space between God and me? What does that really mean? I, I know that there have been times in my life when and, you know, theologians tell us, well, the space represents you're not supposed to be give God reverence and don't get too close to him. And they, they have all these things they conjure up. I don't know exactly what it means, but I know this. There have been times when I've run before God and I got ahead of him and it messed my life up and I should have stayed behind him. But, no, he wasn't going in the direction I wanted to go. And he didn't go as fast as I wanted to go, so I ran around him and got myself into a lot of trouble. There had been times when I did not follow close enough. And I would drag behind. And I'd become backslidden. And it got worse and worse, especially when I was a teenager and a young man. That space. There's something about that space. You've got to be able to see him, see where he's at. If everybody's right up around that, that, uh, that ark, then you really can't see. Just a few people can see, but everybody needs to see where God's going, what he's doing. Believe a space. But I thought about the danger of that space. It's kind of a vacuum, isn't it? Just think of all the things that come, could come into that space that would keep me from seeing God. Maybe it's arrogance. Maybe it would be something like fame to come into that space and I could no longer see the Ark of the Covenant. It could be money. It could be a lot of things that could come into that space so that I'm not where I need to be in following God. It's a vacuum. You know, as Yogi Berra, the catcher for the New York Yankees, he used to come up with some great sayings, didn't he? One of them I really liked. He said, when you come to the fork of the road, take it. Really? A fork in the road, you've got to go one way or the other, don't you? Well, that was Yogi, wasn't it? You've got to make a choice. A fork in the road. You've got to make a choice. And so, follow God. Leave a space. And secondly, you leave the comfort zone of your life. You leave the comfort zone. I guarantee you, when you follow God, that comfort zone, you have to put it aside and follow Him. Are you willing to do that? You ever stop and think about 
the people in Newtown, Connecticut, when they walked through the door January the 1st, 2012, do you think that they had ever thought within their minds that all those little children would be massacred in their town, in that school, in December of 2012? No, because they'd not been that way before. Now, if you ask them about it now, they could describe it for you quite well because they've lived 2012. But they've not been that way before. They had no idea what was going to happen to them. No idea whatsoever. And sometimes when you follow God, you have to get out of the comfort zone. We American believers become very comfortable in our seats, believe me. My wife and I have our special ones right over here every Sunday. Most comfortable. And incidentally, if somebody changes that out and puts one of those that's got a big bulge in it, I come in on Monday and I change it out because it's just not comfortable. I'm not going to be uncomfortable in church, I guarantee you. <laughs> I'm sure glad we don't have them old pews that they used to have. Wow, man. My Uncle Frank, the evangelist, used to preach for two hours. You sit in a pew. I tell you what, you talk about comfort. You didn't have any comfort there. The comfort zone, following him. And then we have to leave control of our life to God. You have to leave his face, leave the comfort zone, and leave the control of our lives. To God and the reason that is important because we've not been that way before are you willing to do that let God take your life this year and say I'm going to take you on a journey you've never been before you think you'd be scared you remember when they were getting ready to go across the Jordan River in chapter 2 of the book of Joshua God said to Joshua be of great courage be not afraid I tell you, they were going into new territory. Am I willing to let God control my life as such? I don't know. Watch for God, follow God, and live for God. Live for God. Notice the verse. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The word sanctify means to set yourselves apart. It means to live a good life. It means to live a godly life. Let me ask you something as American Christians today. Is there anything wrong with being a godly person? Is there anything wrong with being a kind person? Is there anything wrong with being a person that is a good person? that is a loving person, a caring person, a person that really cares for God and lives for him. And so he says to them, sanctify yourself. Set yourselves apart unto God. Remove everything from your life that would keep you from seeing God. You know, I'll have to admit, thinking last night, my December was the pits. I mean, there were things that happened I didn't enjoy. And I want to tell you something. I found myself backing away from God, that space. I let some things come in to that space that moved me away from God. Part of that was my prayer life, my study of the Word of God, caring for people. I let other things fill that vacuum. I really had to deal with God last night, or he dealt with me. I, I guess I better put it that way. He dealt with me last night because he said, let me tell you something, Al. You know, this is December. We've had situations with my wife's stepmother that we've issues, and we're having to make some um, plans for the future. And, and I don't take that stuff real good. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd like to make you think I do, but I don't. And so it... Um, it was something that just came in between God and me. You ever talk to yourself about you and God? Am I the only person that does that? Or do you sometimes say, God, where am I really at with you? Or God, what is this going on in my life? 
No, you don't. I'm sure you do. I'm sure there's times when you deal with God. You talk to yourself. You talk to Him. What's going on? What's happening? I'm not where I need to be in my spiritual life. What I like about this scripture. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. He's saying, Al, today is your day. Sanctify yourself, and tomorrow is God's day. If you will do that, you will see the wonders of God in your life. My day is today to set myself apart unto God. And God said, Al, if you will do that, then tomorrow is God's day, and you will see the wonders of God in your life. Sanctify yourself today, right now, this Sunday, is my day. Tomorrow is God's day. Let me just list a few things <coughs> that you might expect from the new next year. You will have new experiences to face. And that's good. That's a good thing. New experiences to face. You might not like them. They might not be pleasant. And yet they might be great. You will have new experiences to face. You will have new problems to solve. <coughs> My wife and I already know that we have a problem that we're going to have to solve. Not within ourselves, but with a family member. You will have new problems to solve. You will have new trials to endure. Make no mistake about it. They'll be there for us. You will have new temptations to meet. You will have new opportunities to grasp. The wonderful thing about getting older is there's still opportunities out there for you to grasp. Things for you to do. Opportunities that you would think that you would never have in your entire life. A couple of months ago, a pastor was able to go to Topeka and speak to a group of pastors. And, and um, a pastor in Winfield is going to have the pastor's meeting in January. He was sitting at a table with myself and another old codger, old pastor. And uh, we were... We were talking about life and how life happens and how God works in your life. And so he called me a couple of weeks later and he said, you know, I was listening to you guys talking. He said, I never heard stuff like that before. I said, what, what, what is all this about? And so he asked me to speak to the pastors in January about some experiences that I've had. A new opportunity. You say, don't you get excited about those things? I get scared to death about those things. But I, I enjoy the opportunity because there's new opportunities to grasp. You never know what God's going to do with your life. You will have new tasks to perform. And you will have new blessings to enjoy. So don't be afraid. Allow God to move you into 2013. Now, let me give you just one little thing to remember when I'm closing. When the Israelites followed the Ark of the Covenant, and they saw God, and they went after him crossed over the Jordan River. They set up the memorials. And the next thing was to go to battle. The Battle of Jericho. You remember the story? I want all the men of war march around the city once for six days. On the seventh day, I want you to go around seven times. I want the priests to have the trumpets. I want them to go before the Ark of the Covenant. And when they sound the horns, and to blow the trumpets, and the people cry out, the walls will come tumbling down. You remember the story. It happened. Why did that happen? Because they followed God all the way across the Jordan River into the new land to take on the battle. But here's the problem. The next city they were to take was Ai. And Joshua sent some spies up to Ai, and they came back, and they said, you know something? There's not very many people up there. Let's don't send all the warriors up there to the AI. Let's just send a few. In fact, it is they sent about 3,000 up there to AI. When they got up there, they got themselves whipped. 
36 men died just like that. The Israelites went running back home. And God came back to Joshua and said, Joshua, I want you to go back up. I want you to take 30,000 men up to Ai. I want you to have the king, everything that he has, his land, it's yours. I'll give it to you. You go do it my way. And the Bible says they did. Now here's what happened. The minute that you have a great high point in your spiritual life and you think God just really took care of everything for you, you have a tendency of going back and taking control of life yourself, which is what Joshua did. And they went back and said, wow, look at us. Man, Jericho just came. All we did was walk around. And Jericho came tumbling down. We can go up there. We can whip them guys. We don't need God. Well, the fact of the matter is, you do need God. You do need God. And so my challenge to you today, watch for God. Follow God. Live for God. Keep in mind, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. There may be someone sitting here today that describes your life. You're just not going anywhere. You're just wandering around. That wasn't a pleasant time. Their lives were defeated. They didn't have victory. It wasn't until they crossed over the Jordan River. It wasn't until they watched for God, followed Him, and lived for Him. And then they found victory. And maybe you're here today, and last year was not a good year. And you lived the life just defeated. Finances weren't going like they should be. Marriage wasn't going like it should have. Relationships, job, I don't know what it might have been. But there could have been something that filled that vacuum, that space, so that maybe you backed away from God. Maybe you say, you know, if that's what it's all about. I don't really need that. I almost did that one time when I was pastoring. And I said, if this is what pastoring is all about, this is what church work is all about, I'm out of here. And I went off looking for secular work. I just backed away from God because I didn't understand these things, that God wants to work in my life. He wants to lead me next year. He wants to lead you. But I know this. In a year's time, a lot of junk can really pile up in my life. It takes me away from my relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to have you think about something this morning. One nice thing about going into January is that you can wipe the slate clean. Get it out of here, 2012, and start a new year. Just a few minutes, we'll give you an opportunity. Maybe just come up here and just unload it. If your life has been defeated, wandering in the wilderness, there's no victory in your life, your marriage is blah. Don't know what to do financially. Relationships stink. Jobs lousy. If that's you, it may not be you. Maybe last year was a great year for you. You know if it was? I would thank God a thousand times over for that year that he gave to you. He was very gracious to you. If you had a blessed year, he was very, very gracious to you. And so we're going to pray. Brother Grace is going to come. Maybe there's something right where you're at. You say, God, I really want to follow you next year. It's a good time to start January the 1st. Just wipe the old year out. I want to watch for you. I want you to be a great part of my life. I don't think there's any doubt, but what if you know Christ as your personal Savior, that you love Him? But maybe it just isn't working. Maybe some of the things we looked at today say, wow, I need this for my life. I need that space. I need to follow God. Maybe you're here today and you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we just celebrated Christmas, the birth of a baby few months we'll celebrate Easter, the death of that baby as a man. That's why Jesus was born, 
That's why he went to the cross, to die for the sins of mankind, for yours, for mine. And the Bible says that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus gives to us the forgiveness of sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Think about that. He allows you to have a small part of his righteousness because he took your sins and he took mine. That's a great deal. You'll never get a deal at Walmart like that. He took your sins and gave you righteousness. And maybe today you're struggling. Maybe it's a point you want to give up. We'd like to invite you to come to talk to someone that could help you to find Christ as your personal Savior. Most important decision you ever make in your life is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's why he went to the cross just for you. Start the new year off right. Would you stand? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you today, and I thank you, Lord, that we have an opportunity just to share you, just to share the possibilities in God. And Father, as we prepare to start a brand new year, 2013, none of us have traveled that yet. We have no idea. We may not live through next year. And yet, on the other hand, we may live joyously. We, we don't know. So, God, it is vital that we be prepared. But God, that we watch for you. Where you go, we go. We follow you, and we live for you. Lord, I pray that you bless this time that we have. For people maybe just to pray and say, God, I want to get started off right. Maybe some to come to the altar and just pray and say, God, I've got to unload right here. I don't want to take it into next year. And maybe someone here that would like to come to know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior so that they can walk in the newness of life. Father, to have their sins forgiven, that burden of sin, and to have the promise of eternal life to know that someday they'll see Jesus Christ face to face. Father, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.